All right, Tyler, the time has come. We are finally recording uh, the first YouTube video in underwriting a single tenant net lease asset. Uh, we've been talking about doing this for a while. Are you excited? I'm excited. Excited to, to show to, to show everyone a great deal and, and how we look at it. <laughs> yeah. So um, with our first with our first kind of recording, um, you know, our goal is really just to kind of show you guys um, how we underwrite single tenant net least assets. Uh, my background for the last six and a half years has been uh, developing uh, and buying and selling of single tenant net least assets, primarily in the South. So um, we, we've talked a lot about this, as I mentioned, and we just think there's value in going through and talking about these types of deals. Uh, these deals are not, you know, elaborate, um, super, you know, get rich overnight type deals. This is more of your mail, mailbox money type deal. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that's right, Tyler? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh... You know, these these are these are, you know, in this case, credit tenants, you know, pay their pay their bills monthly, take care of all the all the maintenance and expenses. So so really, these deals act a lot like like buying a corporate bond or any other kind of fixed income. Um, there are some slight differences and then we'll get into that when we look at this deal specifically. But uh, yeah, these are not, you know, super compl complicated real estate deals. These are these are pretty straightforward, but they do have nuances. And that's what we want to go through. Excellent. Yeah. And so the goal with, with most who purchase um, um, these type of assets and, and everyone has their own situation. So it's not a one size fits all, but it, it's kind of that mailbox money. You, uh, you know, you check your account, they paid their, you know, they paid their, their rent and you move on. Uh, there's no, no responsibility. So if you, if you moving, if you're moving from say um, a management intensive uh, multifamily unit, uh, and you exit that, and you need to place money. What we find is a lot of people want to move into kind of a more uh, kind of an easier easier management process, and that's where single tenant net lease comes in. So with that said, uh, let's hop to it. Tally, you want to share your screen? Yeah, I'll, I'll share right here. So let's see your pop up there. So the, the the deal we're looking at today that we're going to go through line by line is actually this O'Reilly's Auto Parts. Um, this is in Dunlop, Tennessee. This is a deal. This is a, this is a building and a tenant that is, you know, this is a deal that's for sale today. So if you're interested in finding out more, you can just, you can contact us. Um, we'll put a link down in below the video, but this is a deal that's for sale today. It's an O'Reilly's auto park, um, on Rankin Avenue here in, in Dunlop, Tennessee. Um, you know, if you look at it, zooming out a little bit here, you see the O'Reilly's auto parts and, you know, you've got. Um, a pretty busy retail street here. You've got, you know, Little Caesars Pizza, Sonic Drive-In, et cetera. Um, it's a typical retail street in, in Middle Tennessee. Um, so that just gives you a kind of a geographic overview of where it is. But when we look at the deal itself, I'll pull up my, my Excel sheet here right now. And I've, and I've pre-filled this in a bit. So to save time, um, well, one, this one is kind of a, a tip. Yeah. One Sorry. second on Dunlap. What Dunlap is, is it's a suburb of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and so, you know, you'll notice if you look at that, it's not a highly, you know, a, a super large retail corridor. Um, but it is a suburb of Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is growing very well. It's a beautiful community. Um, you know, probably about an hour and a half, two hours from Nashville, where, where I'm located. So um, it's important to just kind of know that. I mean, not every asset class is going to be, excuse me, not every single tenant net lease asset is going to be in a large town. A lot of these are scattered out through smaller communities and suburbs. So, uh, yeah, as you can see right there, you got Chattanooga. Where's Dunlap on there? Yeah. Dunlap is right so here. Just north. Yeah, just north. So anyway, I just want to add yeah, some color. Just north. Sorry to interrupt you. Let's yeah. keep rocking and rolling. Yeah. Right. So it's just north of, as I said, it's north of Chattanooga there. So this specific deal I've filled in, these deals typically, the way these work um, with these single tenant net lease assets is you'll have an initial term of 10, 15, maybe 20 years. And then afterwards, you'll have the tenant option to renew for five year periods at a time. So on this specific deal, um, the initial lease term was 15 years, started in August 18. So there's you know about 11, 11 years left on that initial lease. And then they've also got the option uh, of five year renewals and four of those after the uh, this next 11 years is up, right? So 
Um, this is a triple net lease. So, Wes, do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between a double net, triple net, absolute, absolute, triple net, just to clarify that? Yeah, sure. We'll, we won't spend a lot of time, but we'll triple net um, in an absolute triple net lease. There's zero landlord responsibilities. Uh, and I mean zero. I mean, the only responsibility you have is to check your bank account to make sure that they paid you on time. That's it. You're not doing any maintenance. You're not um, having to, to request any sort of insurance documentations. It's literally sit on a beach, look at your phone to make sure they paid on the date, on the date in the lease. That's it. Um, and so that's the easiest way to explain it. We'll, we'll probably do another video talking about lease types uh, right. at a different time. So, so, so this deal specifically is a triple net lease, but it's not an absolute triple net lease. So what does that mean? It means the tenant is going to pay you the rent. They're going to pay the insurance. They're going to pay the property taxes and they're going to handle all of the regular maintenance. What that doesn't mean is they're going to take care of the roof and the structure. So because of that, we need to slightly modify the way we look at this in Excel to include a small reserve each year for uh, that eventual time when you're going to have to do maintenance or, or replace the roof or do maintenance on the structure. So that's, that's, that's a key thing to remember as we're looking at these deals, whether it's a double net, triple net, or absolute triple net, it's going to affect your cash flows down here below. So you need to know that. Yeah, and, and it gets a little confusing. I mean, some people would even call that a double net lease um, and, and not triple net. So that's why, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of time going over those nuances. But good, good job pointing that out, Tyler. Okay. And the other thing that's really important on this lease and you always have to pay attention to is whether it's a corporate guarantee or a franchise guarantee. And if it's a corporate guarantee, what is the credit rating of that corporation? Because that, that will directly play into what the, the value of the lease is in comparison to, say, uh, an equivalent corporate bond. So in this case, uh, it's a corporate guarantee. It's O'Reilly's, the corporation that's guaranteeing this lease. So, you know, they're on, they're on, uh, on the hook for, for making all those payments. And I've already gone and looked this up. You can look it up on the uh, S&P ratings website. The corporate rating for O'Reilly's is triple B. So we'll be using that down below to help us discount the cash flows. Um, from this lease. Um, and then a few smaller details here, you know, this building's 8,000 square feet. It's on a one acre lot. And, and we've already kind of looked at that geographically. Um, so let's start here with the acquisition. So the asking price for this building, for this, for this property is just over 2 million bucks. Um, and the first year rent is just over a hundred thousand. So that's th what they're trying. What they're doing is they're selling this at um, what we call a, a 5.1% cap rate, which is basically the first year rent divided by the selling price. They're, you know, uh, this, this building is being sold at, or this, this lease is being sold at, um, yeah, they basically 5.1%, 5, 5 which is the uh, net lease divided by the price. No, do we think that's a good price, a bad price? Is that what the market's asking? That's pretty typical what the market is asking today for, for this type of asset. Um, but as we'll kind of look at here in the Excel sheet, we can, we, we may not totally agree with that price. And, and also it's going to depend on, you know, the investors needs, whether that's a good price or not, you know, if they really need to. Yeah. Winston. No, just wanted to point out, um, the, the price is the net operating income divided by the cap rate. And that's how they got to the, to the two plus million dollars there. So just want to make sure that was clear. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, if you look here, um, we're first going to look at the operating cash flows, right? So we're first going to assume that we pay the price they're asking, and see what kind of return we would get. And then later we'll look at what price we think we should pay for this asset. So if we assume we're going to pay the price, um, let's assume we have one percent closing fees. Uh, our total cost is going to come in about two million forty thousand um, for acquisition. And then we look at operating our year one. Um, NOI or, or near one, a year one, sorry, base rent is not just over 103,000. Here's that capital reserve we were talking about. Uh, we don't have any maintenance costs, but we're going to put 2,000, 2,000 a year in, in capital reserve um, to cover any future roof expenditures. And that's going to get us down to our net cash flow. Um, this particular lease doesn't have a yearly increase in rent. What it has is um, a year 11. And then after every renewal, if they happen, it goes up 6%. So because we're already in year four on this lease, at year seven of our analysis, which would be year 11 of the lease, we're going to have a 6% bump. And then we're assuming 6% bumps 
um, at each of these years. So if you look across here in your cash flows, you can see that starting in year seven, you have a 6% bump in the, in the um, base rent, and then it continues. It continues from there all the way across, right? Um, so that's our, those are our cash flows. These are the cash flows that we're going to be analyzing from the, from the lease itself. Now, the, the next thing we need to look at, which is uh, the other component of how to value this thing, isn't just the cash flows and the probability that they get paid. It's what's going to happen when the lease is up. So for this type of scenario, we're assuming we're going to get to year 11 when our initial lease is up. And one of three things are going to happen. One, the tenant is going to renew and they're going to you know, add that 6% to their rent and they're going to keep paying rent. And we, and we could potentially sell the asset at that point. That's scenario one, tenant renews and we sell. Um, scenario two is the tenant leaves and we need to do some kind of um, modification to the building in order to get it ready for a new tenant. And then that new tenant will come in and lease and then we'll sell. And then scenario three is, you know, the nightmare scenario where the tenant leaves, the building is completely unusable by any other tenant. And we just need to knock it down and put up a new structure that we're going to lease to a completely different uh, style of tenant and and then we'll sell the building so that's the worst case scenario and each of those three scenarios and this is why and and Winston can talk this probably better than me but this is why location is so important because if you have a great location the probability well, first of all the probability that your tenant doesn't renew is very low and secondly the probability that if your tenant doesn't renew and you can't easily adapt it to a different tenant is also low so if you're in a great location this third scenario will almost never happen but if you're in a not a great scenario maybe you have a really weird building it's it's you know not something that's easily released then you have to take into account that third scenario so it's not it's not reasonable to, to look at the market and say that the market you know um you know o'reilly's are selling at five caps all over the country and you know you buy an o'reilly's at a five cap it's not reasonable because if your location is really good or really bad you need to adapt uh, your purchase price up or down based on the chance that when the tenant leaves you need to you need to totally tear down that building and and put up a new structure. So it's very important to analyze properly these three scenarios. Yeah, and no, great job, Tyler. You're you're 100 correct. Um, one thing to point out is that a building, you know, you're not really buying the building, right? A lot of uh, investors they want to go and get on the roof of a, of a single tenant net lease asset that they're buying and check the roof and do all this stuff. You're buying the paper, right? You're, you're buying the fact that O'Reilly's is paying you every month for, in this case, 11 plus years. Um, but the building does matter because you, the building comes with it. And so as we're pointing out, you know, what will be the, the usability should things go bad, you know, with this tenant? Um, one good thing with an O'Reilly's building is it's pretty open, right? It's, there's not a lot of rooms and not a lot of walls internally. Um, it's just kind of an open shell um, that they've, you know, put shelving in and, and, and kind of some counters, and that's it. Um, there are other assets that are, are far more uh, specialized, you know, medical office, for example. So um, good, good job on pointing that out. You know, there's, I would say there's a fourth option, too, which is everyone's dream, Tyler, is that you buy one in a market, uh, maybe a larger market, say Chattanooga, um, and the, the growth expands so much to where the value of the dirt underneath that O'Reilly's or Subway or whatever um, then becomes more than the value of the of the triple net asset, right? So um, there is a, maybe a four scenario or other scenarios, but these are the most common ones. Uh, the one I just said would, would be, is a dream that everyone everyone wants, but few get. So, yeah. Great. Um, and let's, let's just dig in a, a little bit real, real quick in these three scenarios. We don't need to spend you know, too much time here. But um, so in the case of the scenario one where the tenant renews and you sell. So this rent would be the year, you know, this year 11 rent. Um, that's just from the from the lease contract. And then you'd want how you get to the exit cap. The exit price would be with an exit cap rate. So they're asking uh, five, a 5.1% cap rate on this purchase. The reason I'm using a 5.65% cap rate here is that, you know, 11 years from now, and we're assuming that market rate is 5.1 and the market rate doesn't change. It could, it could go up, it could go down. But assuming the market rate doesn't really change, 
we should still increase the cap rate that we use on uh, on the sale um, because the building's going to be older. You know, it's not a, it's not a brand new building. Um, it's an older it's an older building. You know, it's got a bit of wear and tear. Typically, um, what I see in, in general underwriting practices is five basis basis points per year. So you should you should age your your cap rates by five basis points a year. That's that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's a that's a, a kind of a typical underwriting um, uh, procedure. Um, so I'm I'm doing that here. You know, eleven years at five basis points a year. Um, the exit cap rate will be five point six five percent. You've got some selling fees, and your net reversion at that point in scenario one is about you know one point nine five million dollars. Um, in scenario two with the adaptive reuse. You know, we've got an 8,000 square foot building. I'm assuming, you know, in order to get this this building up in shape for a new tenant, you're going to spend maybe $75 a square foot. That's debatable. Um, but you want to kind of get an estimate on what you think you would you would spend for an adaptive reuse of that building. And then with all that together, what you end up with is a 1.68 million um, net net reversion value. And then in this worst case scenario where you need to knock it down and, and do a whole new building, I'm spending... You know, two hundred and fifty dollars a square foot to build a new building, um, and then I lease it out. And in that case, I'm only you know making four hundred and fifty thousand at that point. And then I and then I basically with those three scenarios, I have to decide you know what's the probability of each one. Now for this analysis, I've decided you know seventy percent for scenario one, twenty for two, and ten percent for three. And that and that all needs to be you know that's all debated. You need to look at the market. You need to you know. Um, Come up with an estimate you think is reasonable based on on what you see going forward there. Do you want to add anything to that, Winston, or or do you think any of these numbers should be changed? No, I think um, every every situation is different. Every market is different, um, and so this may change um, depending on the market or where we are uh, in in the in the cycle. Right. So today uh, we're recording this. Um, there's a lot of change going on in cap rate. Uh, with interest rates, um, you know, the list price on here, excuse me, the list cap is at a 5-1 cap. You know, a lot of people are getting debt at a higher at a higher rate than that number, right? So these things can change, but in regards to the probabilities, I think that, those are some good percentage points. I maybe even put scenario three at a, at a lower percentage point than that. Um, and again, everyone's different, and everyone's situation is different. Um, some people want to buy and hold forever. Some people want to hold on to it for a little bit of time. So I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't change that much. Okay, just to show how this works, right? You can see the net reversion value with these probabilities is 1.75 million. If I was to, as Winston suggested, maybe lower that scenario three, um, you know. 80, 15, 5 instead, you can see how that's now gone up to 1.83 million, right? So because we gave a higher probability to the tenant renewing and a lower probability to a rebuild, um, we're using a higher value um, on the reversion. So that makes, you know, that means we're assuming our investment is worth more. Um, so if you come down here, basically, when you get down to the analysis part, we've, we've entered all of our cash flows and all of our assumptions. Um, you get an 11-year pro forma that looks like this, right? You're going to output 2 million. You're going to have, you know, 100,000 or so a year in cash flows up until the last year where your net reversion is about almost 2 million. And if you look at that on an IRR for an IRR, uh, that's only a 4.33 IRR. So the IRR in this case is actually less than the asking cap rate. And the reason for that is one, um, because the rents don't, don't increase very much. And, but mainly because the reversion value um, we're using includes the probability of an adaptive reuse and the, the probability of having to, to rebuild, right? So when you see a cap rate, for example, of, of this one in the market at 5.1%, that's not actually directly comparable to say a bond yield. If you were going to buy a bond, maybe it says, you know, the yield is 5.1% and the cap rate of this asset is 5.1%. You can't just compare those directly. You actually have to do this type of analysis to see what the IRR is for the real estate asset. And the IRR is directly comparable to a bond yield. Um, so just, you know, for, so just so that's clear. Um, and then down here, I've, you know, I've, I've gone and looked this up uh, today. Actually, today I think it changed a little bit. This was yesterday. It was 6.02. I think they had 6.00. Um, just change that. Um, but a triple B corporate bond 
today, in today's market is trading at a 6% yield. So just so we're clear here, if you were to buy this at purchase price, you'd be, you'd have an IRR significantly lower than a corporate bond, which probably has more liquidity um, than this asset. So apples for apples, it doesn't look very good, although there may be scenarios that have to maybe have to do with uh, tax deferral or, uh, you know, other scenarios where it would make sense to buy this at this rate. But just comparing it, if you had the cash in hand and you could either do buy a corporate bond or buy this asset, you'd, you'd probably want to buy the bond at this price. Um, taking that into consideration, you know, if we have a six, what, what do we think you should buy this for if we were doing this apples to apples comparison? Um, if the bond is, you know, 6% yield today, then, you know, we should probably be asking 7% for our cash flows, right? Let's give ourselves at least some room, if not 7%, maybe at least, you know, 6.5%. But we have to give ourselves some kind of premium because as I said, that bond is, is liquid. You can, you can sell at any time. This is a real estate asset. It's not. So because you're giving up that liquidity premium, you should be demanding a higher yield from your real estate asset than the, than the exact equivalent credit rating corporate bond. So at minimum, I'd be asking for a 6.5% discount on my cash flows. And then because at the end, there's a chance I might have to actually do some work and knock this thing down. I would ask for at least, a, at least 100 basis points above the, uh, corporate bond. So, I, you know, 6.5 and 7, I'd even say, you know, 7 and 7.5 would be where I would start. And then, you know, you could come down a bit off that. Um, but, you know, you definitely don't want to go below 6% on the way you discount these cash flows. So if you look here, you know, when you discount your cash flows at 7%, they're worth, in today's money, they're worth 774000 And if you discount your disposition at 7.5%, it's worth 827 so what's the purchase price that we think um, we should pay for this asset? Given these discount rates we're using on our cash flows, we think we should pay up to $1.6 million for this asset. That would be a suggested purchase cap rate of 6.43%, which is significantly um, cheaper, significantly higher cap rate and significantly cheaper purchase price than, than what's being asked in the market. But just by doing an apples to apples comparison, and again, I know it's, every investor has a different uh, situation, but just if this was your situation, this is more or less what would make sense um, to make an offer on uh, for this for this asset. Yeah, and so clearly, um, when you go in and make an offer uh, at this at this price, um, it's going to piss some people off, right? I mean, you know, they they come in, they price it, but cap rates for the last two years have been compressing and getting very, 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 very slim, right? Um, and and so that has really, really pushed pricing um, high. And there's, there's really, um, we're in a situation right now where things are transitioning. You know, um, this asset probably won't sit on the market, excuse me, probably will not be sold as quickly as it would have 12 months ago, right? There, it is going to sit on the market longer than what um, it, it did, you know, 12 months ago. So, uh, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> There's a lot of reasons why this is a good deal for people, um, and maybe we'll talk about that at the end. I don't know, Tyler, but um, so just keep in mind, like this is our opinion on this asset at this moment in time. That could change tomorrow with the changing uh, in the markets. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I said there, there, there's, you know, there are reasons to buy this asset at the price it's listed. Um, this specific price that I'm suggesting here would be based on an investor who has cash in hand and has the option to invest in, you know, whatever they want. And they're not necessarily locked into real estate because of, you know, tax deferral benefits or a situation like that. Um, if you were just to, to finish up here, if you were to buy this um, at the price we're suggesting, the unlever unleveraged um, IRR would be 7.34%. And then, you know, using some, you know, pretty uh, normal uh, assumptions here on, on a loan you might get, you could get up to, say, a 9.6% IRR using, you know, uh, a commercial loan with a 6% loan rate. And again, that would depend on, you know, your banking relationships and, and you know, what kind of rate you could get. But, um, so that's that's the analysis for this deal uh, for this scenario. But like you said, Winston, um, 
it all well, depends on your, on your situation. Bit. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the levered though, because we spent a lot of time on the unlevered and my experience has been a lot of folks are using leverage, right? Um, I think it's going to, I think that's going to, you know, um, change a little bit, you know, over the next several months. It already has been changing. But um, let's talk about the leverage situation. You know, a lot of people want, they don't want to spend, you know, put down $2 million. They want to leverage that at the bank and try to chase that higher yield. So um, let's talk about that, Tyler. I mean, you've got in this scenario, um, you're saying that we're going out and getting 70% leverage so they're putting what 30 percent down mm -hmm. yeah all right so what is uh let's see what what is 30 percent? i don't think we have that on there but uh you'd come in with the cash of 30 percent, and you'd have a loan amount of what one point uh 1.12 1.12 yep yeah. and is that based off of the two plus million ask price no that's based off of the price that we're offering the 1.6 all right great gotcha gotcha Okay, um, so what what type of cash flows are we looking at here? Assuming they they accept our one point six million offer. Yeah. So so if we were to go down here and look at the uh, leveraged cash flows which we've got right here, you know we'd be out of pocket about five hundred thousand to start. We we'd be making about thirty three thousand. Um, well, I'd have an interest only pay. I've got an interest only period here. So five uh, five years. But let's just simplify things and assume there's no interest only period. So. These are these would be the cash flows if you were paying a 25 year advertising loan with no interest only period. Um, you know, you're out of pocket 490, you'd be making 14,000 a year uh, up until that rent bump at year at year seven, you make 20,000 a year, and then you get a million back at the end, right? And so when you be, said a million back in the end, that is assuming they renew and you sell the asset um, at a uh, at a certain cap rate that we're projecting out. Uh, in year 11, which clearly we don't have a crystal ball. Um, no one really uh, knows. So we're just making a guess, our best guess today. So that, right. So that, that year 11 million bucks is the weighted average of the three scenarios, right? So that's mm -hmm. assuming based on the probabilities that we, that we discussed, I think we ended up with 85, 10 and 5% of the three scenarios that, that a million uh, 30,000 is the weighted average of those scenarios. So that's not assuming that we, that they re renew and, uh, and we just sell it as is. Oh, okay. that's assuming that's including the, 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 the probabilities and the other scenarios as well. So, okay, cool. So, so, so technically it could be more, right? It could, yeah, it could be, it could be, if yeah. they, if they just, you know, renew, it could be more. This is, this is accounting for everything that can happen. Great. Great. Um, and you know, over here, the loan rate today, everybody, every every person is different, and so uh, the loan rate will change based on your banking relationships and, and kind of what you're thinking um, there. So keep that in mind. Um, it, it it isn't probably advised to to get an interest only loan, just depending on your on your situation. Um, it may not be advised. So, Tyler, it, can we simply? put in the uh, purchase price that they're asking. So, so let's say that we gave them the two, uh, we gave them 2 million bucks. What does it look okay. like then? Let me just modify this here. Uh, no, actually, if I do this at 5.1, it should be pretty close. Let's do five. I'm just I'm just messing with the numbers until they get to where we want to be. So it's there's yeah. no real. Uh, so don't do this at home, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Last try. I'll get there this time. Four point seven five. Okay, so we're pretty close. Yeah, let's, let's say that's where we, where we go. We we go uh, in and we uh, instead of a five point one, we offer a five two cap. Fantastic. Right. We got a little right. bit of we're a deal there. Yeah, so we're offering nearly two million bucks, right? In yep. that case, the levered the levered IRR is is horrible. Um, why? Because money costs more than this asset produces today, right? So yep. if we have a a, a four point six eight percent IRR uh, unlevered, eight six percent. Well, I mean, guess what? We just made our investment a whole lot worse. 
So as mm -hmm. you can see here in this scenario, it's it wouldn't be a good idea to buy this levered because we'd be getting a two a two and a half two point two percent IRR. And not not only that, Tyler, um, if you look at the cash flows, you're having to pay in an additional six six thousand a year. Um, you know, there may be some situations where this makes sense, but, but for most people, um, they're not going to like this scenario. But what are some options? I mean, I think some options, Tyler, could be that we increase uh, the amount of capital that we're putting down, right? So could mm -hmm. do things change if we, if we get maybe 50% leverage? Yeah, let's see what happens here. Right, so now we're, you know, we're putting in more upfront, really a million in upfront. Um, but we're cash flow positive, you know, and we've improved our, our return a little bit, even though it's still lower than our unlevered return, it will always be lower than our unlevered return because our yeah. cost of capital is higher than the, than the unlevered IRI. But it's, it's a better scenario for someone who maybe needs to stay in, stay in real estate, needs to, wants to close on this asset, um, wants to be cash flow positive, you know, something like this is something that could work. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about who, who may do this deal? Um, I mentioned earlier someone moving from a multifamily asset, for example, selling it. Those guys have been getting super low cap rates. Um, so maybe a California investor who, who owns uh, multifamily assets, they sell their property, got a crazy cool cap rate, and now they need to place capital. Um, they have a 1031 deadline. And you know what? They kind of want to spend more time in, in Hawaii or, or Mexico. And so they say, you know, I'm not going to put this in management intensive assets anymore. I'm just going to buy triple net assets and hang out. Or in this case, uh, double net uh, or, or modified triple net. So they may sell that and they're under a clock. They're, they have a 1031 deadline. And so they can put all cash. Um, they're fine with taking the risk that we outlined be before. Um, they bought an O'Reilly's outside of Chattanooga, um, and they're cool with that, right? And so they're they're fine. They feel that their their cash um, is best used by not paying capital gains today by deferring using the 1031 strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. there are other benefits, and and you'll have to talk to your your, your CPA about it, but. There are other benefits than just what we're showing here, right, uh, that, are, that are tax benefits and, and uh, reasons on why someone may still choose to, to purchase this asset. Um, another, another point is just someone who's got maybe not all of the cash, but maybe they have a million bucks uh, in 1031 money. Um, and they say, hey, you know, I can go out here and get 6% today. Um, I have just enough that's... 50%, I can take 50% leverage, and guess what, I'm gonna cash flow. That's gonna add another 24,000 uh, uh, bucks in my pocket. And what we're showing here are the reversion possibilities, right? So there is a high chance. I mean, most people that, that I know are not doing a reversion calculation in their, in their analysis. Hardly anybody that, that, uh, that I, I know that has purchased, <coughs> excuse me, some of our assets do a reversion analysis, um, which is fine. Every investor has their own strategy. Um, so this right at the end, uh, the levered IRR based on MPV uh, could be higher, right? If, if in fact option, the, the highest probability option, which they stay in, they renew the lease, um, and you've got another five years plus on the term, you know that that could be a higher number. So there's a lot of variables in in this. Well, let's just let's just do this real quick, right? It's three and a half percent right now. I can you know we can move up here and we can say, you know, what if it was a hundred percent? What if you know they renewed with a hundred percent probability, right? Let's bring that purchase price back down to you know two million or so. And now we're at 4.12, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, in that scenario where they renew, their returns are higher than three and a half. They're 4.12%. Yeah. And just keep in mind, even though it's lower than that 5% unlevered, 
that person didn't have all cash to go out and buy, buy it unlevered. They had to use leverage to purchase the property, and then there, there could be tax benefits, either through 1031 or other, other tax uh, benefits as well. So, uh, yeah, it all depends on the investor. Well, well great job, Tyler. Anything else? No, I think that's it for this one. Um, you know, and it, as we do these in the future, we'll, we can look at a, you know, a variety of different scenarios. But for, for this specific investment, you know, I think that's what, uh, what we wanted to show today. Well, I don't know. Tyler, if you're an investor today, do you, do you buy, sell? What do you do? What do you do? Dep- depends on the opportunity costs. Depends on what else I can do with the money. Yeah, Good there's, all, there's always a reason to buy and there's always a reason to sell. It 100% depends on your personal situation. Good answer. I think it's important. It's very important to remember that each individual has their own situation. So uh, we try to look at every individual situation and make the best uh, decision for that individual. So good job, Tyler. I think uh, I think you did a great job on this first video. We're going to try to do these on Tuesdays, right? Yeah, yeah. One yeah, video so, per week. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe uh, maybe some changes, slight changes, uh, and if you guys, you know. Or if there's anyone who is actually watching this uh, and, and want to see something or uh, change or have any comments, let us know. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. And thanks, everybody else. All right. Thanks, Winston. Cheers, guys.